NCT-127's latest comeback, Superhuman, features such attractions as being awesome, people floating in the air, and a combination of standard fancy chords and some quite unusual for pop. Let's discuss these in reverse order in this episode of Classical Composer Breaks Down the K. To understand what's happening harmonically, we need to look at intervals, and to understand those, we need to look at pitch. Pitch is a spectrum, a continuum of higher and lower frequencies. There are no inherent divisions within the nature of pitch. But much as we tend to parse the visible spectrum of light into particular named colors, like red or orange, we tend to conceive of frequency in particular named pitches. And in much of Western music, as well as in K-pop, there are 12 per octave. Some musical traditions use different divisions of the octave. The fact that we categorize into these segments doesn't mean that the points between them don't exist or that we don't hear them. We can have a pure idea of blue, but we also see how there are many kinds of blue, slightly different from each other, while still recognizably blue. We can hear the pitch continuum, but relate the pitches we hear to moving between or being adjacent to the ones we have names for. The octave is the most basic interval. Two notes that sound very similar, but with one higher or lower than the other. Because of this similarity, pitches are named in a repeating cycle of pitch classes. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, if you're from America or a few other places, or La, Si, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, if you're from most of the rest of the world, including Korea. I'm using a piano keyboard to show this because it makes the pattern easier to visualize, but always remember that there is no piano keyboard inherent in the nature of sound. As you can see, there are other notes between some of these. The note immediately above another note is that note's name with sharp, and sharp is represented by a symbol similar to a slightly rotated octothorpe, although the sharp symbol predates the octothorpe by centuries. The note immediately below a note is that note's name with flat, represented with a stylized lowercase b. This means that the same note on the piano can be spelled either A-sharp, because it's immediately above A, or B-flat, because it's immediately below B. There are reasons why dividing each octave into 12 parts, as opposed to any other number, has useful properties that explain why that division became common, although not universal, but those are beyond the scope of this video. Now that pitch is divided into 12 parts per octave, we can use those parts as units for determining pitch distance. Each of those 12 divisions is called a semitone, or half-step. Two semitones are called a whole tone, but semitones are a more useful unit, so I'll mostly be talking in those. So there can be an interval, that is a distance in pitch, that is three semitones, or two semitones, or five semitones. In some contexts, intervals are simply named by the number of semitones, but more often they are named in ways that associate intervals of somewhat similar sounds. Intervals of one or two semitones tend to sound smooth if played in sequence, because they are so close, but have an active, dense sound if played simultaneously. These intervals are called seconds. The smaller second, only one semitone, is a minor second, and the larger one, two semitones, is a major second. Intervals of three or four semitones tend to have a warm, colorful sound, and are called thirds. Similarly, the smaller one is minor, and the larger is major. The interval of five semitones has a pure and stark sound. Rather than being major or minor, it's called a perfect fourth. One semitone larger, that's six semitones, is quite unstable and dissonant. It's called an augmented fourth, or a tritone. After this, the pattern reverses. Seven semitones is a perfect fifth, a somewhat more stable complement to the perfect fourth. Eight and nine semitones are the major and minor sixths, with similar properties to the thirds. And ten and eleven semitones are the sevenths, with similar properties to the seconds. The octave is, as aforementioned, twelve semitones. This reversal makes sense. Imagine if you have a minor third, let's say E up to G, if you move the E up the octave, now you have a major sixth. Nine semitones, but because it's another configuration of E and G, it sounds similar. There are other types of intervals like augmented seconds and diminished fourths, but we're not going to deal with them in this video. Most harmony in K-pop, as well as in some Western classical music and a lot of jazz, is based on stacking thirds. The lowest note in the stack of thirds is called the root. And the root is the beginning of the chord's name, like D major, or G minor 9. Three notes arranged in thirds, like are called a triad, because tri means three and there are three notes. Four notes arranged in thirds, like are called a seventh chord, because a seventh is the interval between the outermost notes in the chord. 
Now you might be thinking, Hey Sean, if the one with three notes was called a triad, shouldn't the one with four notes just be called a tetrad? Yeah, it should be called a tetrad. In related news, it's not called a tetrad. The system for naming chords is messy and poorly designed, but we're stuck with it. If you add another third up, that's called a ninth chord. Keep stacking thirds and you get eleventh and thirteenth chords. In general, and this is a simplification that misses a lot of subtleties, but going into more nuance we'll have to wait for another video. The more notes in a chord that are major intervals above the root, the brighter the chord will be, and the more notes that are minor intervals above the root, the darker the chord will be. For example, a G major 7th chord with a major 3rd, perfect 5th, and major 7th above the root is pretty bright. By contrast, a G minor 9th chord with a minor 3rd, perfect 5th, minor 7th, and major 9th, that is a major 2nd plus an octave above the root, is somewhat dark. It's not as dark as it could be, but it's a lot darker than the G major 7 chord. I realize I'm dropping a lot of names for chords. If you haven't learned them before, don't worry about knowing exactly what each chord name means. Just pay attention to the intervals above the root. So let's start out with a D major triad. This might not look so much like a stack of thirds. D to A is a perfect fifth, A to another D is a perfect fourth, and only D to F sharp is a major third. But if the A were one octave higher, it would be a stack of thirds. So it's still a D major triad. And the third at the top, is still in the original chord as a sixth, so the sound common to thirds and sixths persists. This highlights how stacking one sort of interval results in other sorts of intervals. Stacking two thirds creates a fifth. Adding another third creates a seventh, which adds the energy that comes with seconds and sevenths to the sound of the chord. This is part of why harmonies using a lot of chord extensions, that is, stacks of a few thirds, tend to sound so full and colorful. The thirds are vibrant to begin with, but the other intervals resulting from stacking them add a lot to the texture of the chord. So a progression like D major to a G minor ninth chord, as happens early in the song, is a move from a bright, pure chord to a darker, much thicker, fuller chord, creating a sense of adding depth and of colors blooming out. In the pre-chorus, there's a progression like this. These are all 7th and ninth chords, so each chord is quite colorful and shiny. But while the root isn't moving much, each chord shifts between bright and dark colors, so each color contrasts with the last, making the others stand out. Let's look at perhaps the most iconic part of the song, the yeah! chord. It's E, G, A, D. That has a third, but also a second and a fourth. And unlike the previous D major triad, there's no way to revoice it into being a stack of thirds. Move the G up and it could be a stack of fourths, but under no arrangement is this a chord built of thirds. And the greater proportion of fourths or fifths, with their starker sound, fits the metallic aesthetic of many of the backgrounds, or of them transforming beyond humanity. The fact that the yeah! chord is so unusual in pop, as well as the fact that it's the entrance of the singers in the song, makes it instantly memorable. We generally think of melodies as being thematic because you remember a tune. In this case, the chord alone can be thematic because it's so striking on its own. And that's one of the ways that Superhuman transcends. Like most pop, it uses third-based harmony, and does so very effectively. But it also ascends beyond the limits of regular pop harmony, as NCT 127 becomes Superhuman. As for floating in the air, after last year, they decided not to touch, the ground that is, and instead to follow their dreams, and go up. As for Superhuman being so awesome, there's a lot that's worth talking about in this song. This is all that I could cover within one episode of this format, but if you like this, which is to say if this episode goes over well, I'd like an excuse to talk more about Superhuman. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Composer Breaks Down the K. Now go listen to Superhuman some more. If you add another third up, that's called a ninth chord.